Perfect. Uh, thanks a lot, Natalie, for introduction. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Um, before starting, I'd like to acknowledge to you, uh, James and Natalie, for putting all the efforts in organizing this great virtual seminars in biomedical science and for uh, giving me opportunity uh, today to talk and uh, share part of my work and other researchers that we are developing at Tissue Engineering Research Group, which is led by Professor Fergal O'Brien, uh, which uh, is um, placed in RCSI. My today presentation will focus on describing the strategy that we are developing, which aims to regenerate bone tissue and which is based on the delivery of microRNAs from biomedical scaffolds. Uh, first of all, why we need those scaffolds based strategies. So bone is second most frequently transplanted tissue after blood and each year there are around 2 million of patients that undergo bone grafting procedures, which generates huge cost to global healthcare. Moreover, we know that uh, bone injuries are related procedures are becoming more frequent due to the overall aging of the society and overall sedentary lifestyle. Uh, in the field of bone regeneration, the autograph still remains the gold standard. Uh, those grafts are usually harvested from the iliac crest from the patients, uh, but account for quite reduced availability. We basically don't have much more, uh, much spare bone uh, in our bodies that we can uh, transplant to the wounded site and also and they require two surgical interventions. So we are uh, increasing the risk of infection and also pain uh, to the patient. Uh, that's why uh, in TERG, we are looking for alternative solutions like synthetic bone grafts, uh, which uh, are supposed to serve as a template for the immigration and infiltration of native cells. Uh, those scaffolds mimic natural composition of bone. Similarly as bone, they are composite materials, composed of organic phase, which is mainly collagen, and inorganic phase, which is hydroxyapatite. Both of those are the major uh, components of bone. And what is also important, some of those technologies were already successfully translated into some clinical applications like uh, uh, this product, hydroxycol. Uh, what is also very uh, interesting is that uh, these collagen-based scaffolds are a great starting point and grand template for the development of other materials that emergenerate of other specific tissues. So basically uh, we can uh, modulate physical chemical properties and we can modulate cellular response to those materials by, the, uh, by altering, for instance, the composition and adding different uh, biomolecules like glucosaminoglycans, ceramics, uh, chitosan or alginate. And those several modifications in, uh, in composition are currently investigating in the group in other projects aiming for uh, mainly uh, regeneration of a nerve or cartilage repair. We can also alter uh, and modify the mechanical properties. We can modify stiffness or pore size of those scaffolds through uh, mainly uh, adjusting uh, the cross-linking procedures uh, and all those parameters are quite important uh, to cellular uh, response. However, the main disadvantage of uh, the scaffolds is that they are not intrinsically osteogenic. It means that they are not able to induce mesenchymal stem cells to differentiate into osteoblastic cells, into cells uh, that form bone. And this stimulus is extremely important when we are dealing to, um, uh, specific, especially when we are dealing to regenerate large bone defects. And to address this issue, we could incorporate different types of biomolecules like uh, proteins, growth factors, or gene uh, therapy to modulate uh, and to recruit cells and to, uh, to stimulate the adhesion and proliferation within the scaffolds. Uh, it could be also antibiotic to prevent any possible infections. Uh, what is important in uh, delivery of molecules is uh, to make it safe and to provide controlled and sustained uh, delivery. And today I'll try to explain and uh, convince you why uh, gene delivery it's, uh, it's the good way and why we like uh, microRNAs and why uh, we also like the non-viral vectors for delivery and for those uh, bone applications. Uh, so there's a big range of gene therapeutics or gene or nanomedicines that could be delivered uh, into the cells in cells, we, uh, in TER, we have a broad experience working um, with different uh, gene therapies, uh, especially in delivering plasmid DNA for bone and cartilage regeneration applications. And in recent, in recent years, we were focusing especially on this uh, 
RNA interference and we are delivering small interfering RNAs, siRNA or microRNAs. And as the name indicates, uh, those molecules silence uh, the genes of interest. So um, basically uh, what we are able to achieve is to silence gene expression and subsequent translation into proteins that have negative effects on tissue regeneration. And also big advantage of those material of those nanomedicines, it's that unlike recombinant proteins that do not require high dosages. So um, they should um, bring less risk to the patients. Uh, actually, I don't know if you're aware of this case uh, and of this medical device, which was a BMP2 infuse, uh, which was a, a collagen sponge delivering BMP1 of the BMP2, one of the strongest stimulants also of osteogenesis, uh, which uh, started to cause a lot of problems in 2013 to many patients, which started getting very serious adverse effect in ectopic bone formation. That's why we are believing um, gene therapy, it's a better way. Uh, and that's, in, that's our rationale for using uh, gene therapeutics. The principle of this method is that we are uh, producing nanoparticles with incorporated microRNAs or siRNAs, and which we are incorporating into our collagen scaffolds, uh, uh, which are uptaken by the cells. And in that way, uh, the cells are able to engineer therapeutic proteins. Uh, so basically, our approach is to use cells uh, to produce uh, to produce proteins. So we are using them as a protein drug factory, or in other words, we are teaching them how to produce cartilage, bone, or any other relevant tissue. And why microRNA and what exactly microRNAs are? So microRNAs are small non-coding nucleotide of approximately 20 to 22 uh, base pairs, uh, which are involved in broad spectrum of biological processes uh, they are delivered, once they are delivered to the cytosol of the cells, they are binding to the risk complex, uh, to the messenger strain. And in that way, they are inhibiting the translation into the proteins that have negative effects on tissue regeneration. Uh, and we like uh, these microRNAs because they are able to silence multiple proteins and multiple pathways. Uh, this is because they are not fully complementary, so they can bind to uh, different messenger, messenger RNAs. And the other great advantage also of uh, microRNAs is that uh, the mechanism of action happens in cytosol of the cell. So uh, we don't need to deliver, uh, deliver them to the nucleus as it happens in case of pDNA, what makes this delivery slightly easier because we are just crossing one barrier and we don't have to cross two barriers uh, to deliver uh, to the nucleus. However, uh, the main limitation of um, all nucleic acids, it's that they, are, uh, that they have poor stability and there are some issues with the cytosolic delivery. And that's why we, uh, and also um, this is because they are uh, negatively charged. So the cells are not really keen for uptaking them. And that's why we're incorporating them together with non-viral vectors uh, to first protect them for the environment and to uh, deliver them in more uh, controlled uh, way. Uh, to the cells in TERG, we are working with uh, several vectors involving nano, HA, chitosan, uh, or PA, and uh, just uh, and we are able to deliver those um, uh, those uh, acidic, this, those uh, those uh, microRNAs or siRNAs into the cells. I will just show you a very nice video from one of uh, PhD students who is working with siRNA uh, for cartilage repair. So on the uh, on red, you can see nanoparticles. On the in the middle, you can see the cell and uh, how the cells are internalizing into the cytosol uh, the nanoparticles uh, over time with their Pac-Man-like behavior. Um, it's almost finished. Okay. Yeah, now it's done. So uh, coming back to non-viral vectors, uh, we like them because they give us transient effect. Uh, so uh, this is very important because we are looking for the temporary solutions. We don't uh, want to cells to stimulate too much. So we don't want, to, want them to produce uh, too much bone, too much cartilage. We don't want any ectopic formation of, uh, of tissue. So uh, that's the reason for using uh, 
non-viral vectors instead of uh, uh, viral ones. So in previous works derived from TERC, we showed that microRNAs can be, and both mimics and inhibitors can be combined with non-viral vectors. Uh, in this study uh, was done with uh, nanohydroxapatite. The incorporation of microRNAs did not affect the size, uh, neither the potential of uh, nano HA. And you can observe how those nanoparticles or the ag aggregates of those nanoparticles looks on uh, with TEM images. And the confocal images also demonstrated that we are able to deliver uh, those red nanoparticles uh, into human mesenchymal stem cells here, just like here, there are just tiny spots associated with a uh, cellular membrane. What is also important, uh, this transfection with uh, this particular vector and microRNA uh, is not cytotoxic. There's no cytotoxic effect, so human MSAs. And we demonstrated that uh, this, trans, uh, this transfection is efficient and we can uh, silence the gene of interest um, up to at least seven days. In this case, it was uh, mere microRNA-16. Furthermore, these vectors uh, can be effectively incorporated into our uh, 3D uh, collagen-based platforms. Uh, here are images of the, mac of the microstructure of those scaffolds. Uh, here, the naked scaffold, and on the right-hand side, um, you can see uh, nanoparticles, tiny nanoparticles of nano HA and microRNA incorporated into scaffold within uh, collagen fibers. And again, we demonstrated that 3D platform is also suitable for effective transfection and silencing of specific genes of interest, uh, either working with uh, microRNA mimics or uh, inhibitors. And no cytotoxic effects uh, and uh, no effects in general in cell proliferation on those uh, materials. Further, we also use this platform to investigate uh, for the delivery of specific targets for bone regeneration. And in this case, the study was done with microRNA 133 inhibitor. This is because uh, this particular microRNA was reported to negatively regulating RANX2, which is the key transcription factor in osteogenesis. So we assume that uh, if we are inhibiting the expression of this microRNA, we would be able to stimulate the expression of RANX2. So um, again, those nanoparticles, uh, those microRNA was combined with nano HA uh, into nanoparticles and combined to scaffolds. Uh, and cells afterwards. Uh, we showed effective silencing of uh, MIR-133 in our 3D platform, which was translated into uh, enhanced expression of RANX2 and, RANX and higher calcium levels, and finally, greater mineralization, cell-mediated mineralization on, on the scaffold. Uh, we also studied either the system is also effective in in vivo environment. So in this case, the scaffolds with micro RNA nanoparticles were implanted into calvarian defects in rats, and uh, micro CT images can demonstrate that um, we can obtain full closure of defect uh, using the scaffolds with uh, inhibitor of micro RNA 133. What is also very interesting in the histology images. Uh, with, in which we stain uh, the populations of macrophages, we are able to demonstrate that uh, this scaffold with this particular microRNA is able to recruit anti-inflammatory uh, one M2 macrophages, uh, and in that way probably probably stimulate the, the osteogenic and the, the osteogenesis and the bone growth. Uh, recently, uh, through NSF SF500 project, we are investigating the delivery of microRNAs using cell penetrating peptides. Uh, this is done in collaboration with the researchers from Queen's University of Belfast, Professor uh, Helen McCartney and uh, Dr. Monika Zimińska. Professor McCartney patented uh, RALA peptide. This is a positively charged peptide, so it allows us, it allows them uh, to create nanoparticles uh, through an uh, electrostatic interaction between positively charged RALA and negatively charged microRNAs. And those nanoparticles we are able to incorporate in our, to our scaffolds and investigate how do they work with uh, cells and how do they stimulate osteogenesis. In this particular study, we were investigating um, two different microRNAs, one mimic and again, uh, uh, one free free inhibitor. Uh, either in separate platforms or in the co-delivery platform where we incorporated both uh, microRNAs 
uh, into the scaffolds. Uh, as CM images showed that we don't have any changes in the architecture, we don't have any changes in the porosity of the scaffolds and we can effectively incorporate those nanoparticles into our materials here. Uh, uh, it's dosage one microgram per scaffold and three micrograms per scaffold. And you can see those tiny dots, which are the nanoparticles. Uh, we also visualize them through a confocal microscopy. Those nanoparticles were previously stained either with Psi-5 or uh, Psi-3 fluorophore and we could actually make cross-sectioning through the thickness of our scaffold and see a, a very nice uh, distribution and demonstrate that actually uh, we are able to incorporate the scaffolds within an uh, entire thickness, in nanoparticles within entire thickness of uh, our scaffolds in both uh, in all three platforms that we studied and the, the height is uh, of uh, four millimeters. Uh, so the area quite uh, thick. Um, what is also really nice, we are getting very uh, high loading efficiency of those nanoparticles into our materials, which ranges between 95 to 98%. And uh, this is the release, which is uh, in fact quite burst and it happens during first 24 hours uh, and after that time it reaches the plateau independently of the dosage and independently of the type of microRNA that we are incorporating but what is interesting is that the scaffolds only released 30 percent so we are still getting retained uh, 60 percent of our cargo after 88, uh, 28 days of uh, cell culture. Uh, we also assessed how those scaffolds uh, behave in terms of uh, their osteogenic potential. So we were using uh, human mesenchymal stem cells and uh, we demonstrate that uh, both uh, platforms, uh, both microRNAs are able to enhance ALP activity, which is early osteogenic markers, either when they are delivered separately or when they are delivered in dual delivery system. And was also, and it was also sorry, translated into enhanced uh, mineralization, cell mediated mineralization in our scaffolds. We haven't seen actually any differences um, between uh, dosages, so uh, they are kind of uh, showing similar trends. Um, so just to uh, final remarks and just to conclude, uh, we can show that our in our platform we can incorporate uh, effectively. Uh, therapeutic microRNAs. Um, we can deliver them either uh, separately or as a co-delivery system. Uh, it could be also microRNA mimics or inhibitors and we can use different vectors for this delivery and uh, these microRNA scaffolds are potent platform to stimulate osteogenesis and in vitro and in vivo and I hope that I convinced you that uh, those microRNA scaffolds could be also very uh, nice and uh, potential platform for different applications in tissue engineering. And finally, I would like to acknowledge um, all third members that are here on this photo and it would be impossible to squeeze all the names here. Uh, collaborators, especially Dr. Monika Zimińska, uh, my founding uh, previously NSF SFI funding and currently Marie Curie uh, individual fellowship. And I'm happy to answer any of your questions now or just please drop me an email. Uh, thanks, thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. That was a really interesting talk. Um, if anybody has any questions, please post them in the chat. Um, we'll read them out for Joanna. Um, so I guess I can start by asking a few. Um, so I wondered if you checked for any antiviral responses against the incorporation of the um, interfering RNAs. Obviously, once they're kind of the double-stranded RNA, do you see anything? What do you mean by, uh, by uh, could you repeat again? Yes, so I was wondering with the introduction of the interfering yeah. RNAs, um, obviously once they hybridize to yeah. target, do you see any activation of an antiviral response within kind We of haven't the checked tissue? yet, actually. We haven't, uh, no. Uh, yeah, it would be very interesting, but no, we, we haven't investigated actually the, the response. Mm -hmm. uh, with that. I just wondered if maybe the increase in inflammation might also help with the kind of the deposition of any uh, matrix or anything. Hmm. Uh, uh, we have a project which probably should start soon where we'll be investigating actually uh, the interaction of some specific microRNAs with uh, inflammatory cells. So I hope uh, update you um, anytime soon how, uh, 
how how it works and uh, if there's in, what is the response of uh, of, uh, of immune systems of immune cells on that. Thank you. Um, and then I just wanted to, like I probably missed it, um, but what was the kind of full time course of looking at the implanted scaffolds? Did you ever see full reuptake of them, like full incorporation into the tissue? So the uh, full time course of in vivo study is up to twenty eight days. So we are. Uh, yeah, we are uh, implanting scaffolds up to four weeks um, in calvarian defects. Uh, currently, soon we'll be also starting. Uh, uh, the, we, will, we will be also implanting those scaffolds into uh, femoral defects. Probably we will increase this time up to six to eight weeks. But uh, yeah, it haven't been decided yet. Mm -hmm. And do you see a full uptake and incorporation of the collagen scaffold? Uh, not full. It's it's partial. You can still uh, find the remainings of of the scaffold after after that time, but it's mainly um, uh, it's mainly uh, mineralized. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, so I think James had a few questions uh, for you actually. So I'm just going to pass it over uh, to him. Hopefully, I didn't ask the same questions. <laughs> I have different questions. Um, so <laughs> my first question was looking at the SEMs. You well, with the nanoparticles on the collagen scaffolds. Yeah. So you have a very clear topograph topographical difference there. Um, yeah. So I was wondering if that could maybe exert an effect on the on the osteogenesis. And then equally with the hydroxyapatite system you're using as a, as a vector, um, yeah. could the hydroxyapatite itself be exerting a sort of chemical um, cue to, to stimulate osteogenesis as well as the microRNAs? Uh, okay, I'll start for answering your second questions because uh, uh, always in our studies when we are working with nano HA um, vector, nano HA vector is always incorporated as a control group. So we are incorporating uh, into scaffold just nano HA nanoparticles uh, without uh, attaching any microRNAs. You're still getting a slightly better response because obviously you are incorporating calcium phosphate into uh, into material something which is uh, which is osteogenic or fence stimulating osteogenic osteogenesis but it's um, not uh, we are not getting uh, that high uh, ALP on that high mineralization when we are uh, just using nano EJ alone and uh, regarding the first question uh, yes the topography might affect I mean it is known that topographic topography affects the um, the cellular response, but we haven't investigated either. Uh, either the slightly modifications of the topography can uh, can affect the uh, can stimulate or can affect in either, in either way cellular responses. Yeah, I think a good a good um, sort of control to answer sort of my questions and Natalie's questions would be as like a scrambled microRNA, if if that's uh, if that's possible. There is scrambled in those studies. Okay. There is okay. scrambled. Yeah, yeah. And the response the response was lower. Yes, okay. yes, yeah. I mean, on those three images, uh, I'm not sure yet if I can uh, be back. I'll try to uh, share again my screen. Uh, I'm not sharing, right? No, not at the moment. No. Sorry for that. Um, yeah. On those. Ah, uh, here, images here. Uh, you can see them, sorry. Yeah, I can see them. Uh, yeah, uh, here you have empty effect and uh, defect, and here you have, um, oh no, actually, uh, sorry, in this one, no, in this study here. Uh, here, uh, in in vitro study, we have scrambled, incorporated, uh -huh. either mimic or either antagomir. So we are yeah, usually evaluating. Here haven't been included in the in the graphical abstract, but they are. Uh, they are in the study as well, and uh, here actually also uh, the answer to your second questions. Right, we have uh, cells alone. We have cells with nano HA vector. We have cells with nano HA vector who scrambled, and uh, finally the scrambled with our specific microRNA. Would it also be yeah. possible to? Sorry, James. <laughs> I was just going to add to that. So obviously the scrambled RNA won't necessarily be complementary to anything in the cell. Is there anything? Hopefully not harmful to also. It, it might growing. be. They might be. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's what happens with uh, that's 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 the limitation or and um, however you want to say it. Uh, working with microRNAs because they are not fully complementary, so they can bind 
um, uh, to another uh, messenger RNAs in the in cell. Yeah, we are always uh, having this this risks that uh, our controls might not be real control groups actually. So we have a couple of extra questions for you as well. Um, so here we go. Um, so oh no, that was cool. So um, Pranav asked. Can uh, you explain more the conditions under which the release kinetic studies were performed? Um, he mentioned this was on the second to last slide that you showed. Yeah, uh, in this, uh, this study, the this study that I showed you, the release was done in static conditions in cell culture media in 37 degrees. Uh, soon we are starting also dynamic studies uh, and, we were, and we will be looking for um, dynamic release, I mean the release under dynamic conditions and also degradation uh, of, our of our scaffolds in, in dynamic conditions. But the results that I presented, it was, um, it was static. Excellent. We have uh, one last question from Henry. Um, thank you for the amazing talk, Joanna. Is the nanoparticle system having long-term inhibition of the production of the negative effect RNA? Um, uh, what I can tell uh, what I know from, from the studies that we performed, we are able to silence up to 14 days. We haven't gone any further, at least with um, microRNAs for bone repair. But I know that they are uh, people from group PhD students working with uh, microRNAs for cartilage repair, and they are still seeing silencing effects up to 28 days. I mean, it's not that pronounced, but it's still significant compared to the control or to the scramble. Um, and then another question from Giska. Uh, does the mRNA incorporation into the scaffolds give limitations to sterilization? We are actually incorporating uh, microRNAs uh, after the scaffolds are uh, sterilized. Uh, and uh, microRNAs uh, are sterile by, by cell. They are coming sterile in sterile appendor. So, um, yeah, there's no limitation because basically we are not using them prior to sterilizing the scaffold. Okay. All right. Thank you so much and for answering all the questions. Um, so I'm just going to pass back to James now to, to wrap up and introduce the talks for next week.